Good evening, everybody. Welcome to JWA's now post-quarantine book talks. I'm Judith Rosenbaum of the Jewish Women's Archive. I am so happy to be back with you tonight for the first of our summer series of book talks. If you're new to JWA and to our quarantine book talks, thank you so much for joining us. If you have been with us for months, welcome back. So glad to have you here. Please, as always, introduce yourselves in the chat box. Make sure to chat to panelists and attendees and uh, so we can see who's here and also be sure to add your questions to our conversation as we go along. We are delighted to be able to continue offering this program and growing this community and we're grateful to Jewish Live for their partnership as well. Before I introduce our featured author for this evening and we begin our conversation, I want to say just a few words about JWA for those who may not know the fullness of our work. We are a digital archive that expands the Jewish narrative by documenting and sharing Jewish women's stories. We take an intersectional approach to Jewish history and culture because we believe that uncovering a more diverse story helps us understand the world that we live in and helps us create a stronger, more just future. The quarantine book talks are one aspect of JWA's work and I hope you will check out jwa.org to explore the full range of projects and resources that we offer. I am really delighted to welcome tonight's speaker. Dr. Chandra Prescott Weinstein is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy and core faculty in women's and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. She's the author of The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred. She's also a columnist for New Scientist and Physics World. Her research in theoretical physics focuses on cosmology, neutron stars, and dark matter, and we'll hear a little bit more about what those things mean. Um, she also does research in black feminist science, technology, and society studies. Nature recognized her as one of 10 people who shaped science in 2020, and Essence Magazine has recognized her as one of 15 black women who are paving the way in STEM and breaking barriers. A co-founder of Particles for Justice, she received the 2017 LGBT plus physicists Acknowledgement of Excellence Award for her contributions to improving conditions for marginalized people in physics, and the 2021 American Physical Society Edward A. Boucher Award for her contributions to particle cosmology. Originally from East LA, she divides her time between the New Hampshire Seacoast and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Welcome, Dr. Prescott Weinstein. So glad to have you here with us tonight. Thanks for having me, and please call me Chanda. <laughs> OK. Um, so maybe let's just start with how you came to write a book about cosmology and black feminist thought. It doesn't seem like the typical uh, project of a physicist. Yeah, I guess maybe the answer to this question is that it was supposed to be maybe more atypical in that originally and the book was conceived as an essay collection that was going to be based on essays that I had been publishing online, primarily on, on my blog over at Medium and just kind of building those out and expanding them and, and taking time with them. And when I actually sat down to, you know, actually start filling it in and start writing it, I realized that the book wouldn't make sense unless there was all of this physics in it. Um, because I had to contextualize for the audience why all of this mattered to me in the first place. And so originally I would say like the book was maybe gonna be more on the black feminist thought side. Um, but the book that I had always hoped that I would write, like from when I was, um, you know, finishing high school was, was kind of my version of A Brief History of Time or Cosmos. And so what came out was kind of, in some sense, my version of A Brief History of Time or Cos, uh, with, with maybe a Cosmos spin to it. I think Carl Sagan, um, in his holistic approach to things, was a big influence over the, the whole project. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, you're muted. You clearly had that kind of book inside you and uh, and didn't know that that's what needed to come out, I guess. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very surprising because, you know, when you're doing nonfiction, you write a book proposal. So you don't actually submit a completed project to publishers. And so you go through this whole process of this is what the table of contents is going to be. These are the summaries. Here's a sample chapter and all of that. And so you think like you have a really clear idea of what the book is going to be. and um, then the book sort of tells you about itself as as you are writing i um, which i'm sure like for anyone here who who's already written a book or two you're like yeah that's how it worked <laughs> but i actually hadn't had anyone tell me that that was that was possibly the experience that i was going to have and then um i was very lucky to be in a situation where i actually wrote uh, most of the first draft over the course of about a month 
And um, I, I, so I, in some sense, really got to sit with it for that period of time and have it kind of unspool itself to me. Well, um, so there's a lot in the book that is very deep in physics, as you said, you kind of needed to explain that to give the context, but, um, but there's a place in the book I was trying to you know, as I read these books for these programs, I leave them around the house. And then my family asks me like, what is this book about? And it's great. It's a great opportunity for me to be like, you know, try to put some shape to it. So I was trying to explain. And then I was like, oh, she actually has this like great way of explaining it in sort of different kinds of non-scientist terms in the book, which is that you say that you're a griot of the universe, a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love that idea. And um, it's much more accessible in a certain way uh, than particle theorist or cosmologist for those of us who are not in those fields. Um, but uh, tell us a little bit more about how you see yourself as a, a storyteller or griot of the universe and, and why it's important to you to put yourself into that lineage. You know, even just going back to your first question, um, you know, the essays that I was writing, I was writing about my perspective on how race and gender were shaping my experience and the experiences of other people around me in the physics community and in the astronomy community. And I, I think that the, the challenge, those of us who are from traditionally marginalized backgrounds in physics and pretty much anywhere, but I'll just talk about physics and astronomy because that's like my, my, my little universe. Um, the challenge that we face is that we have to construct a sense of self that connects to this idea that is in some sense already predetermined, but also is predetermined without us in mind. So we have to kind of like rewrite the, the entire formal formulation of what is a physicist, what is an astronomer. Um, and, and so I think some of that involves going back to what are, our, what are my community traditions for the traditions I bring to the table. And so um, you know, for people who have, who have read the book might recognize um, the influence of the book of Genesis on the, the very beginning, even in, in how I worded it. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really that like I was I was proactive and like I want this to sound like the book of Genesis. It was nothing like that. It was much more that when I sat down to write the words, that's what came out. And you know, I'm I like many Jews promise myself every year I'm actually gonna read the entire Torah <laughs> that year. <laughs> and so that means I've read Genesis a bunch of times. <laughs> specifically because that's the one and I've read the beginning of Genesis a bunch of times because that's the one that we the part that we always like we're still really sticking with it at that point right um and then I think similarly I'm looking at the traditions that come not just from my Ashkenazi Jewish side but also from my Afro-Caribbean side um which is really like I was raised um by the 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 black parent and I'm I was raised very strongly with a sense of identity there and so there you're looking for what is the vocabulary of my community that helps me connect and synthesize. And so I think that that's a lot of the work that I had to do with myself. And that work ends up in the book, partly because um, I think it becomes a vehicle for, for example, writing a cosmology book that maybe, you know, a feminist historian who doesn't usually read cosmology books might pick up and actually read. Yes, definitely my first cosmology book. a lot of the book is about the kind of the social context of science. So can you explain a little bit about what that means, why it's radical to even acknowledge that there is a social context of science um, and why it's important to, to understand? Yeah, it's a strange thing because like, you know, science involves people. <laughs> so you would think in some sense it would be really obvious that there's like a social context for it. Um, but I also think that the, the narrative that we are taught both inside the science classroom and then I think through, through the media as well is that um, science and physics especially is apart from society and, and in some ways is removed and above society. And, um, you know, there's, there's Margaret Wertheim has like a really beautiful book called Pythagoras' Trousers, which I, I highly recommend. I read it when I was um, starting as a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, and it was highly influential. And it was basically about how basically the way that physics was structured was modeled as a priesthood. Mm-hmm. Um, and in a lot of ways, we can see the academy, um, like, you know, universities start with, with the Catholic church. And, and so a lot of how we are, are structured um, is, is, reflects back on sort of our our religious and social practices. And so I think in a lot of ways, um, 
uh, physics is mirroring that kind of authoritative, we are a structure that you're not supposed to notice, you're just supposed to listen to. Um, and so for those of us who are interested in, in the way people things work, that's a really interesting people structure that you, you've got going on there. I think, again, for people who come from backgrounds that are traditionally outside of, of the structure um, or traditionally beneath the structure, um, noticing becomes an important mechanism for survival and actually existing, which is that you, more than anybody else, have to know how the system works because you have to consciously navigate it. It will not be unconsciously navigated for you. People aren't going to put you in place. You have to decide to put yourself there, and that requires an awareness. Um, and then I just want to connect that with something that, you know, people talk about in, for example, Black feminist thought a lot and, and Black studies in general, which is that like if you're Black in the society, you study how whiteness works because it's a matter of survival, right? And so I think really my goal with the book was to give a holistic look at the doing of physics. And my looking at it was going to be different from Stephen Hawking looking at it. Um, it was going to be different somewhat from Carl Sagan looking at it, although um, anybody who's been hanging out on Twitter for the last week might have seen that clip of Carl Sagan circulating on, on the Johnny Carson show, where he actually called out Star Wars for being too white. He was like, how come all of the characters in the movie were white? Why are white people running the universe, basically? <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, even he had that awareness, but of course he was looking at it from the position of, in that clip, he says, they look like us. So obviously, I'm not coming at it from an us perspective. Right. Right. And you say that, like, there's a part in the book where you talk about how the, it's strange that science, which is supposedly about asking questions, only allows you to ask certain kinds of questions and doesn't want to ask questions about the assumptions that scientists might, might make and how science is done or the impact it may have on the world that is either... Um, intended or not intended and you know that the or the questions of certain people are considered appropriate scientific questions and other questions which are often the questions that are actually like most important to ask because they're the questions that are raising up the things that the people on the inside are not seeing um that those somehow are not considered like true scientific questions or they don't fit into the model of the way that scientific questions are asked well when for example i think about my experience with with questions as a student of physics is again coming from the outside i think there's a lot of tension around um you know i so i was an undergraduate at harvard i was totally underprepared compared to my classmates who had gone to like phillips exeter um and um asking questions was, like a, was a very fraught experience because there was like a high likelihood of getting laughed at and i can't think of one professor who ever shut that behavior down in the classroom right so you're learning the lesson of like don't ask questions in the physics classroom and then you know maybe you're looking around and you're like okay so the students of color seem to be dropping the class um or like the students of color um are, are getting all of the worst grades in the class or whatever, you're, you're noticing patterns. And all of these things are actually like, you know, noticing patterns is a really important skill set for, for anyone, but particularly for a scientist. Um, and then people are sort of gaslighting you, like, you know, that pattern's not there or you're misunderstanding why the pattern is there. And so then you're again getting the message of like, don't ask questions, right? Um, and, and so I think one of the reasons I started to be conscious of this actually is because one of my, I guess I'll, I'll share publicly, one of my insecurities as a scientist is that I don't ask good questions. And I actually think like the most important thing that a theoretical physicist can do is ask questions that go in interesting directions, right? Um, it's hard to hone and develop that skill if you're constantly getting the feedback that your questions are stupid, right? Um, which which happens on a regular basis and I think is more likely to happen to people who are noticing these things that we are told not to talk about it <laughs> or who have, you know, I'm, um, you know, who went to public high schools in like Los Angeles Unified School District and so don't have the training. Um, so like your questions are therefore not interesting. Um, but again, I, I think, you know, the thing that I haven't said yet is that this is about power relations. And this is about the power attached to being able to tell someone that's a good question 
That's not a good question. We don't care about that question. And, and I'll just pick an example that is a little bit out, might seem a little bit outside of the social, but explaining to people that a physics classroom is not the place to ask questions about time can be really hard. But on the list of things that we're not supposed to ask about in a physics classroom is how does time work? We don't talk about that. Time is a parameter. It is a tool. We use it to do calculations. We do not worry about how it works. <laughs> Interesting. I don't understand that at all, but I don't understand anything about time. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that that's part of it, actually, is that we don't understand time. And so it sort of seemed like, well, you know, that's a question for the philosophy department or something like that. Right. Um, so I think a lot of how I start to think about communicating this to people and even, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's interesting the direction that being an outsider can drive you in. And I, I quote Alice Walker talking about this in, in the book, that being an outsider can give you this even maybe useful like, um, perspective. I think that I'm very conscious now of teaching students how to ask questions and the significance of asking questions, which I don't think that I got a lot of when I was a student. And um, that plays a really big role in how I teach physics now. Not even talking, like I actually, my research group, they don't hear me talk about race and gender unless they bring it up with me. Um, but they hear me all the time talking about questions. It's built into my syllabi question asking. Um, if you're not asking questions in class, you're probably getting a lower grade in my class. It's interesting. I'm also thinking about like how much Jews ask questions and how much that's sort of like built into our culture that that's how you pursue knowledge and understanding in some ways. I think I think that's a, that's a really key piece. I will also say, you know, I'm I'm a total, I don't know, fanatic about Passover. <laughs> um like that's like the one like sort of part of the Jewish calendar where I get really serious about everything. Um, nobody's allowed to drink until we get to the first glass of wine at my house. I, I, I go all out. And I think that, you know, part of it, I'm, you know, coming back to how the social and our own backgrounds can shape things. The reason that I attach to Passover in the way that I do is as a Black person, um, because the legacy of slavery speaks to me in a very particular way. And, and it took me a long time to figure out that I was experiencing that differently. But I think the part where we're actually supposed to actually consciously stop and think about, like, what are these questions? What do they mean? What questions do we have? Um, it, it is very much like a conscious, you are supposed to constantly be engaging with texts and with the same text over and over again and reevaluating it. Um, and I, I think that society would benefit a lot if that was like normalized across the board, even for Jews to do that outside of Torah, outside of outside of our, our, our holidays. But I think that certainly um, we are given a good starting point for that in Jewish tradition. Yeah. I also am thinking about not just the questions that you ask or that scientists ask, but also who gets you know, not just whose questions are allowed, but also who gets asked questions. And I thought one of the really moving stories in your book was where you talk about how Vera Rubin asked you as a kind of lowly graduate student, or maybe it was even undergrad, um, a question and you felt like, wow, the fact that she's asking me a question gives me a sense that like she takes me seriously and that like I might actually have something important to say. And, you know, we see this like in, this is a slightly different context, but I think it's the same dynamic, like we see this all the time in history and particularly in oral history with women that often, um, you know, if you ask a question and it's a question, people are always surprised that people will tell stories that they've never heard before. And it's like, well, no one ever asked, right? And asking a question can be incredibly transformative. Like it makes you think about things in a different way. And it may be a story that you've been wanting to tell, or it may be something you've never thought of. And the question just, you know, changes how you see your whole life. And so, um, that very much resonated with me, that sense of like being asked a question can be a real turning point in how you see yourself. Yeah, the, the story about Vera Rubin, um, so I, I guess I should give context for everybody else, although I know there's a link in the chat, but Vera Rubin um, was an astronomer and she played the leading role in finding the first substantive evidence for the existence of something we call dark matter. 
we still don't really know what dark matter is comprised of. We still haven't captured it in the lab and played with it. Um, she, she looked at the way stars were moving in galaxies and realized that the stars weren't moving right if the only matter there was luminous matter. And I know dark matter is the, the primary thing that I work on now. I, when I was a graduate student, you remember correctly, I met her at a women in astronomy conference. And uh, within a couple of minutes of us being introduced, she asked me what I thought of the dark matter problem. And at that point, I wasn't working on it. Um, I, didn't, I, I kind of thought of it as a problem that was well above my pay grade um, in, in some sense. And it's, it, it's certainly the case that graduate students typically aren't asked big picture questions about like, what is your opinion on this like great unsolved problem in physics? And that was my first time having the experience of someone being like, yeah, I don't know you. You haven't proved your credentials. Nobody has like written a letter introducing you to me. I just kind of want to know what you think because you are a science student and we're having a conversation. Um, I, I feel I should actually say in context that I thought the thing that I was going to talk to Bear about was that um, when I was a student at Santa Cruz, I actually had Passover Seder at the house of one of her sons. Oh. I was I was one of the strangers that they welcomed to, to their Seder one year. And so I was like, oh, I'm just gonna be like, hey, your family is really awesome. And and they welcomed, they welcomed me into this place when I didn't have anywhere else to, to celebrate Passover. Um, and I see a connection there, which is that she had clearly like raised children who understood the importance of taking the stranger at face value and just talking to them like they're a person and welcoming them like they're a person. Um, I think it's a real shame that the, the Nobel committee let her die without recognizing the contributions that she made to science. And I think that I will probably carry a bitterness about that for the rest of my life, like on her behalf. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a strange thing to say, but I, I, I think that, you know, when we talk about questions that don't get asked, that there's also the, the, the un, what's underneath that is not recognizing the person and recognizing the, the contribution that, that that person can make. Right. Yeah, I, I think a lot of us carry those legacies. We have to, because otherwise no one would remember the person and what the person, you know, the recognition they didn't get in addition to what they might have. Um, I'm glad you brought up dark matter because you write a lot about why that term is problematic and also incorrect. Um, and, and really in doing that, you're talking about why language matters. So tell us a little bit about dark matter and the issues around that label. Yeah, so the, from, from a physics standpoint, um, when we talk about this phenomenon, dark matter, we're really talking about the fact that there seems to be um, many aspects of the universe behave like there is the presence of this matter that we can't see. So to break down, what does it mean that we can't see it? It means that as far as we know, it's not radiating light. It's not luminous. And light doesn't seem to interact with it, at least not to the, the scale where we can readily see it. Um, and so what that means is like, for example, if I were to put out my hands and someone were to actually put a, a dark matter clump in it, I would feel the earth pulling down on that clump. So I would feel like a weight associated with it, but I would, my hands would look the same. And this is because light doesn't really interact with it. The light would go right through it. It would bounce back into my eye. Um, so really um, invisible matter or transparent matter would be a, a better term for it. Um, one of the things that I try to, to go over in the book is why is it called dark matter? And can the fact that it's called dark matter be disentangled from the social context of the people who were first using this terminology? And actually, maybe contrary to what some people have thought, I don't really come to conclusions about this. Like I actually, I, I haven't, I will admit in public, I haven't finished the biography of Fritz Vicky that I have. He was the person who came up with the term dark matter. I don't know what his views on race were. I don't know um, what his engagement with the idea of the quote, dark continent was. Um, I don't know what that word um, in, in German, which was his language, connoted for him. Um, but I think it's a question that's worth asking. And then I think, you know, fast forwarding to 2021, it's, it's important for people who are not people of color to be aware of what the word dark 
evokes for people. And I think there's a real lack of awareness of what dark evokes for people. And this is like translated into um, what I would consider strange uptake of dark matter as an analogy in Black studies for Blackness. Um, in the sense that it gets treated as, oh yes, it's a thing that um, fades into the background because it's the color of the sky, but actually dark matter is something that's colorless. And you know, something that gets lost in that is that actually we are normal matter, black people are normal matter and we're not at all strange. Right, or invisible. I mean, right. effectively maybe, but sh shouldn't be. <laughs> Well, and I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, if we're really, if we get into the nitty gritty, like black people are, are invisible and hyper visible simultaneously. Maybe there's an interesting quantum mechanics analogy to, to, to be had there. Um, dark matter is never hyper visible, right? It, it really is. It's just physically a, a different thing. And you know, I think there's just a lot to unpack there about, you know, I'm um, the magical Negro and the way that like police imagine pretty much anything in, in a black person's hands to be a gun. Um, or imagine that like a permitted gun is somehow an illegal gun or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. But like um, black people can magically transform pretty much anything into a gun when, it, when a cop is standing in front of them. Right. Um, that you know, there, there's a lot happening there that I think doesn't get captured in the analogy. But I think like the key, the, in some sense, the key thing that I wanted to get into in my chapter, Black People Are Luminous Matter, is I wanted to write something that spoke to why Black people had become attached to this analogy, why Black scholars had been using it from the inside that was like, I get the discourse you want to have about white supremacy. Um, and simultaneously said, look, I understand the physics and I want you to understand the physics and to enjoy the physics as something other than an analogy for white supremacy. And that was something that hadn't been done because popular science is usually written with white audiences in mind, whether people are thinking about that or not. If you're not conscious of thinking about people of color, you're thinking about white people. Right. Yeah. And I, I love that you're sort of like acknowledging that it has taken on a life of its own as an analogy, but like also wanting people to have access to the science behind it so that it doesn't just float off into the realm of metaphor without, and sort of therefore like obscure people's understanding of the actual physics that it refers to. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that I kind of get it in the chapter that's, it, I have to say it was like the most awkward chapter to write. Cause I was like, this is going to sound critical. Um, or as, as, as a very good friend of mine who, who is, is a black, like, um, liberation organizer said, Chanda, in summary, you're saying tighten your shit up. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and so there's a little bit of, of, of community critique in there. And it's, it's awkward to do that kind of critical work in front of other people. Right, that, that's, always, that's always a challenge. Um, but there was also this element of black, I as a black scientist feel disappeared by the fact that um, only white scientists are looked at as reference points for, for this analogy. Um, that, and, and in fact, that I see them using white scientists that I know for a fact have been horrible to black physics students as their reference points. And so wanting to say that we are here. And so, you know, I was I did a panel in January um, where the, the panel before us, um, I was in part two, someone declared that like um, space time was a white construct. And then I felt like my entire task was to like respond to that and say, so my, my, my 10 minutes started with a photo of me and other black theoretical physicists and was like, here's a group of people who study space time. This is what we look like, right? Um, so I think that there's also that need to tell everyone that we exist and to detach this idea that mathematical form formulations of how the universe works is like a white thing right. or for white people only and, and um, necessarily only reflects like a, a colonialist perspective. Right. But I, you also write a lot about how part of the struggle is recognizing that the system of knowledge that you are working within is also complicit in 
you know, oppressing your ancestors, destroying their ways of knowing. And, you know, in some ways, I feel like that's sort of like the crux of the book is like, how do I do this work? And in some ways, you're saying you're doing both pieces of it. Like you have to basically sort of normalize your presence in the field and say, this shouldn't be something that is just, you know, owned by white people. And at the same time, recognize that historically, it's been owned and shaped and defined by white people in ways that have been incredibly dangerous to not, you know, to other people, to indigenous people and um, to black people and to all kinds of other folks that are not, you know, in charge. Um, and you, you, you write very beautifully about that, about recognizing that like, this is yours, like it's your cosmology. And it was a cosmology that was like the genealogy of it is really problematic and painful to explore. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that and sort of how you live in that, in that tension? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I suspect that one piece that if I were rewriting the book and I have to avoid temptation because I'm working on the paperback right now, <laughs> um, that I think I would do better is, is talking about, um, you know, when we talk about what constitutes European science, and this is one of the beautiful things about bringing history of science and sociology of science and, and all of these other um, supposedly separate disciplines into the conversation. Um, when we look at the enlightenment and what happened in, in the immediate aftermath of, the, of the, the beginning of what we call like the modern era, um, we see a lot of collation of knowledge from around the world. And so some of this actually really requires revising our understanding and our beliefs about where knowledge actually came from. Um, so being aware, and so one example I do give in the book is that, for example, the reason that um, people from Europe and people from the United States, <clears throat> pardon me, knew that Mauna Kea in Hawaii was a good place to look at the stars is because Hawaiians already knew that information and told them. Mm -hmm. um, we can look at lots of examples of this in, in medicine where um, a lot of medicines are rooted in, in fungi and plants um, that indigenous people knew about. And then it was collected and studied and archived. And so what we really see in some sense in Europe is the power of bringing different pieces of knowledge into conversation with each other um, that when you collect all that knowledge in one place, you can synthesize really extraordinary pieces of information. What you have to be careful about is not assigning all of the credit for that knowledge to the people who are in a specific position to synthesize it simply because of the power relations of you know, who is oppressing whom, et cetera. And so I think that that's something that we have to think about carefully. And I think physicists often see themselves as outside of that conversation because, you know, people weren't synthesizing, um, uh, you know, medicinal plants or whatever, like that's not what we do. But again, um, people were using the knowledge of tropical folks to go and um, study eclipses, for example. Uh, people were also, there's, there's discussion in the history of science literature about where Copernicus first saw the idea for a, a solar system with, with the, the sun at the center. Um, so there's some debate, for example, whether that he had actually read a, a tract from India that, that talked about this idea. Hmm. Um, so there, I think that history of science can at the very least lead us to ask questions and problematize this idea that there was one knowledge system that was more functional than others, as opposed to, you know, who actually got the, the luxury of thinking about these ideas all in one place. When you have lots of information, it's easier to come up with bigger ideas. Right, right. Well, and, and you're lifting up the work that we do in terms of history and that like so much of it is about telling those stories or complicating the narrative about, you know, who's doing what, where knowledge comes from, not giving credit only to one person, even though that's it's easier to, to frame it that way. We have a question actually that's relevant to this. Joan asks about, um, about the question of whether um, 
Mileva Marek, who was Einstein's wife, contributed to the development of the theory of relativity? And if so, was it only gender bias that led to the fact that she was unacknowledged, or were there other issues potentially at work? That's been a big debate, I think, scientifically. So I guess I'm going to point to something in my book. I actually don't talk about this in this chapter, but I think this is a really good example. So I have a chapter called Wages for Scientific Housework. And, you know, I'm, I'm not currently with, with a fellow scientist, but at various points I was in relationships with like um, people who were either also physicists or who had taken lots of physics classes. Of course, you talk about your ideas. <laughs> um, I, I think like a key piece here is um, even my, my, my spouse now, like uh, he's a public health professional with, civil, with training in civil rights law. So um, he like can't remember calculus really. Um, he can also search the archive, which is the thing that physicists use to, to look for papers and read papers, because he's, he's been around me so much that like when I go to visit a university, he can actually find all the papers by the people I'm going to have conversations with and tell me these are the papers that you should have a look at before you have a conversation. When I was on the job market, it was an incredible tool to have him be able to yeah. do that and not, not to have to do it alone. So what I'm talking about here is the, the housework that people do to support our intellectual labor that is inextricable from the, the intellectual products on the other side of that. Um, so I think that historians will be debating for a long time, unless there's a smoking gun, exactly what um, Maleva Marich's like, uh, uh, contribution was, how much of the actual calculations she did by hand, et cetera. Um, of course, I would love to see some kind of like, you know, here's the thing written in her hand. That would be really interesting. Um, but I also think that the debate is settled in the sense that we know that she was raising children so that he didn't have to, that she was maintaining the household so that he didn't have to. Um, there are all of these things that um, she was doing that made his work possible that therefore function as a part of the work. And I don't think we need to debate that. That's clear. I don't know if we get special relativity from him anyway. I think we get special relativity from someone at some point, but I don't know if we get it from him without him having people who are making sure he's fed. <laughs> like that's, um, and that might, that, so that answer might seem like a cop-out, but I think that this is a really important thing. And it's important for those of us who are classed as, um, you know, white collar, middle class and up, to be aware that regardless of our gender identity, expression, et cetera, that we are also benefiting from that unrecognized labor of people who empty our garbage cans and all of these other things that make our science possible. Um, and I, I specifically wanna to point to the fact that um, a farm worker died in Oregon, um, I think uh, just last week um, from, from the heat and um, you know, it's easy to be like, well, you know, uh, maybe they should just stop, but we actually can't afford for them to stop. I mean, I actually, most of my diet comes from farms here in New Hampshire, but that's not how most of the country eats, right? Um, so for me, that's what that question brings up, which is how can we recognize that regardless of whether they knew how to do like um, electrodynamic theory or not, they were making contributions. Right. And I was I was actually also shocked to see when I, I was um, reading through a lot of the pieces that we have on physicists in our archive in preparation for this and um, was just kind of blown away. I mean, I knew this on some level, but was blown away by how many of them were married to other physicists. They were the, the women were not able to get academic jobs. And so but they were passionate about the field. And so they contributed to their husband's research. It didn't lead to their, they didn't have their own lab. They didn't have their own, you know, tenure track line or whatever, but they wanted to do the work. And so they continued to do the work. And of course their name was not attached to it. Um, but you know, they were passionate about the work and they were contributing to it in their own way. And, and it, and it's invisible. And so that's, there's like so many layers of the invisible work, you know, from the the most basic of like how you survive because you're you have food and your you know children are taken care of and your house is cleaned and your lab is cleaned and all of those things um, to even like people contributing in very significant ways that it's not an accident that they don't have the it's not you know it's not it's not 
irrelevant that they don't have their own job. They don't have their own job because of the way that the system is structured. And so that then kind of reinforces itself in the next phase. I mean, and, and, and honestly, we still see that pattern. I'm, I'm sitting here like going over like the number of like academic couples I knew where eventually they came to the conclusion that it was just like better for the family if she <laughs> didn't, um, didn't have an academic position anymore. And some, you know, every single individual situation, there's a, a conversation about it that makes total intellectual sense to me. Um, you know, she was being treated worse by her department. And so, you know, she didn't want to do it anymore. And so, um, I, you know, she found being a mother fulfilling. And that's really important to recognize that sometimes people feel that way. And that that's work and it should be compensated work. And that's what the Wages for Housework movement, which my grandmother Salma Jane founded, was, um, was really thinking about, was compensating that unwaged work. Um, uh, but it is a notable pattern that like, I'm trying to think of, do I know any situations where it was like, oh, well, I'm really passionate about fatherhood and she's getting a salary that sustains us. Like that, that doesn't happen. Um, and, and I think like the key piece about that is that it's easy to just be like, well, you should have married a feminist husband or whatever, or like, you know, it would be better if you just weren't straight or bisexual or whatever. Um, but the reality is, is that um, the societal structural patriarchy creates situations where even if you as a couple are like, you know, the most feminist people in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which used to pride itself on being like hyper liberal, right? <laughs> um, that society is still structured in a way that says like, look, for your financial well-being, keep her home. Right. I mean, it's the whole problem with sort of the choice discourse in feminism, right? Like none of our choices take place outside of systems that are shaping the way we the way we think about them and also what the, the choices are that are even open to us and how um, how good those choices are. Um, you know, as a feminist historian, I loved that you lifted up the names and stories of various scientists who have been, you know, forgotten or effectively sort of written out of history. And it felt so aligned with our work at JWA and, you know, both both in terms of making sure that those stories are known, but even more so in terms of understanding that, um, you know, that it, knowing those stories necessarily changes the whole larger narrative, right? It's not just like, oh, we add those stories and now we have, you know, the information we had plus X of those people, but that actually once you bring those stories in, it, it changes the whole the whole um, way that we understand the larger narrative. So, um, so I really appreciated that, first of all, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about some of the important role models and predecessors for you that, um, that you know, the folks that, whose stories you've, you've uncovered that you've been, um, that have meant something to you. So definitely my next book, I want to talk, well, I guess not actually, my next book's an academic book, but my next like popular science book, um, I want to talk about stars a lot more. Um, which will give me an opportunity to talk about someone that I don't mention in the in the disordered cosmos, which is Lisa Meitner. Mm -hmm. I think maybe she was on the list of, of Jewish women physicists. Um, I really like, I don't know, I, I have like an, an, an unusual attachment to, to, to Lisa Meitner. So she was um, a, a, a woman uh, in the Nazi era. She was from Austria. Um, and she was one of the people who um, discovered nuclear fission. So she discovered it actually with her, her nephew. Um, and she played such an important role in nuclear physics uh, and then had to run for her life because she was a Jewish woman and effectively didn't get the Nobel Prize for work that she did while her um, Gentile colleagues got the Nobel Prize for work they had done together. And I always think about that as, um, you know, an example of how like our political and social environment, I think understanding her story was maybe the first time that I really started to think about those questions. And thinking through the question of her life, I think helped me understand what how do those structures work for Black women today? 
So when I, as a graduate student, I became really interested in her story. Um, and, and it continues it continues to be a, a really interesting one for me. And I, I feel like I should also contextualize this, that before particle physics was a field, particle physics was basically part of nuclear physics, which is something you know I grapple with the complications of that in the disordered cosmos. But that does mean taking an interest in who are our um, nuclear thinking uh, intellectual ancestors. So I, Lisa is, I think, the one that I probably get the, the least number of excuses to talk about. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be at the Jewish Women's Archive where that's like a totally natural, natural thing to bring up. Absolutely. And I, if I remember correctly, she also mentored a number of women um, physicists who, you know, once I think, I'm not sure if it was in, in, um, you know, in Europe or after she became a refugee, but um and I, and I think had, that that kind of like thread also is really interesting to note among a number of these women. Like, it's not surprising that some of the women who were successful in physics were mentored by other women who were successful in physics. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, even just going back to the story about me and Vera Rubin, there's no way I would have crossed paths with her without a women in astronomy conference. Right. Um, I think that rightfully people have started to like complicate why is it women and not women and gender minorities and I'm actually an advocate for these conferences moving in that direction of, of articulating themselves as such, but it, it is clear that it's really important to create spaces where people who um, hold identities um, that are, are traditionally outside of the norm can, can find people like them in easily. And not just like as, you know, sort of caricatures on a page, but as like full three-dimensional people. Like um, one of my, my favorite parts of that, that day where I, I first met Vera Rubin was watching her like fangirl um, about Nancy Grace Roman, who was herself an, an astronomer, but actually is probably best known for being the, the NASA administrator who made sure that the Hubble Space Telescope happened. So she's actually called the mother of, of Hubble. That's that's colloquially how she's known in the community. And um, in fact, there will be a, a telescope. Um, there's a next generation space telescope now, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is, is gonna be going up in a few years. Um, but I she asked me if I wanted to have lunch with her. So I, I was following her to the table and she saw this other old white lady white hair kind of hunched over and said, Nancy, you have to come sit with us. And then she turned to all of the, the young women at the table and said, do you know who this is? This is Nancy Grace Roman. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think having that kind of like multi-generate, like Nancy Grace Roman was maybe 15 years older than, than Vera Rubin. And, and, and having that multi-generational, just kind of um, watching the two of them interact with each other, I think was a really important social experience of, um, this is how you grow up as a physicist. This is what it means to get old and be a woman physicist. And still, and at that point, Vera was in her 80s and was still going to work every day. So, you know, I don't mean old as in like checked out or in any of the pejorative ways that people usually say that, but this is like how you um, become, a, you know, an elder of the field. And it's important to see that role model if people actually, you know, still being there at 80. Right. And, and also seeing that there are multiple, multiple generations, like, cause one of the things that you write about, which I th also thought was really interesting was about some of what's hard about being the first, right? Like you are a number of firsts, right? Like you're the first black woman to be a tenure track professor in your field, right? As in particle theory. Am I right about that? Did I get that right? Um, you know, so. And part and theoretical cosmology. And theoretical cosmology. Right? One of those, I, 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 sorry, I'm interrupting your question, but I will just say that actually I worked out the particle theory thing while I was writing the book. Um, because I'm not the first PhD. Um, but uh, the, the person who uh, first got her PhD in the field, by the time she became what we would call faculty equivalent at a national lab, she had left particle physics. Mm -hmm. Right, which is, um, and that's also part of the story of like all the people who could have been before you, but for various reasons were, you know, yes. perhaps encouraged out or pushed out or just, you know, the attrition that happens in academia yeah. by accident sometimes. Um, but, you know, I think like I often think that in feminist studies and women's history, we often spend a lot of time kind of celebrating first. And obviously there is a lot to celebrate about that. 
but being a first is not easy. And it, it's also really empowering to, to not be the first, to see that you're part of like a long heritage, that there are multiple generations, that there could be multiple generations of, you know, amazing women in physics. And of course, to know that, of course there are, but they weren't called women in physics. They were like, as you write about, you know, sort of women who were looking at the stars and trying to make sense of it, even if they were not in a an academic science context, but how important it is to have that, to see yourself as part of a lineage as well. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as we're having this conversation, I'm also thinking about the fact that I found in my experience that I'm, um, you know, when I went into college, I didn't think a lot about race and gender uh, intertwined. Like I didn't, I didn't think that I would feel like I couldn't connect with white women, et cetera. And as, as I went through college and realized that actually I was having different experiences from, from white women, including white Jewish women, that um, uh, it became harder for me to see women, white women who were ahead of me in the field as people that I could really identify with. And I do think that, that one of the things that I'm very shifted in that moment for me was as was actually bringing back the possibility of that connection. Um, and, and I think that that's something to be aware of, of that complexity, that it can sometimes be hard um, to, to make those connections across um, racial lines because you're looking and saying, okay, yes, in fact, at that Women in Astronomy conference in 2009, they were declaring how great things were for women in astronomy because astronomy programs were finally PhD programs were finally heading towards 50% women. Hmm. And one of the reasons that I, I, my name got out there is because I kept going up to the microphone and being like, I think you mean white women. If you look at the numbers for women who are not white, the, the trends are very, very different. Um, so I, you know, there isn't something straightforward there, but I think it's something that needs to be attended to that, uh, you know, there's a lot of power in the, in the possibility of that connection, but the possibility of that connection um, is, is shaped by our willingness to be awareness of what the potential power dynamics are between us in terms of resource access or perceptions of resource access and being willing to kind of confront that or, or just look past that. And I think that um, Vera had like a very specific style, which was, I'm, I'm not really looking at you physically, I'm looking at you brain. <laughs> which has its pluses and minuses <laughs> yeah. to be able to see people be beyond just their brain. But, but sometimes to be attended to as a brain is also a different kind of uh, attention that could be good. Yeah. I also, I, I just have to comment. I see I'm one of my, my former professors, Michael Dyne in the chat. <laughs> um, he, he's talking about the, the, the different women that very Rubin mentored. And this is something that you do hear about. And I just, you know, want to say that Nada Bacall, Sandy Faber, these are all, um, <clears throat> these are some of the biggest names in, in, in observational cosmology, right? And so the other thing is, is that sometimes, um, you know, when we talk about the legacy of the work that we do, it's not just what papers are your, is your name going to go on, what prizes you win, but also um, who you position to write papers, who you position to actually go on and make significant contributions. And so it's not all about like, what's your name on, but also like, who were you to people in the world? Yeah, I think that is a really important piece. It gets back to that mentorship piece and sort of like what other kinds of science, like any scientist is only gonna do the piece that they do, but if they can cultivate other people to do a bigger piece of another piece of the work, it it builds from, from there. Um, I want to switch gears and ask a different question. I was, you talk in the book about how um, you don't believe in the supernatural, but you begin the, and end the book with Hebrew prayers. The opening prayer is the evening prayer, Hama Ariv Aravim, and the one at the end is, I think, Tfilat Haderach, the traveler's prayer. I meant to look it up, but I forgot, but I yep. think I recognize it. Yes. Um, and you translate God in those prayers as universe. So talk us a little bit about that decision and sort of how you see the relationship between science and spirituality. Yeah, I think like to first order, I'm showing my, my reconstruction aside. <laughs> right. I'm a very active member of, uh, for, for people who are in the Boston area of Congregation Dorsche Zedek. Um, and so, you know, uh, 
originally the the prayer that I had at the beginning was the Shechahiyanu because we often use that as kind of like at the beginning of things. And um, eventually I was like, oh, I should just ask Rabbi Toba about this. So I emailed my rabbi and was like, can we talk about this? And um, Rabbi Toba is like, you know, one of the smartest people that you will ever have a conversation with. She's amazing. And um, she said like, look, since you're talking about the night sky, of course it makes sense to start with the Ma'arif. Um, and then she said, you know, when you're done, you're sending people off into the world to go on a journey. And so it makes sense that I, you would end with the traveler's prayer. That was her recommendation to me. So then, of course, I was like, OK, but what about like translations, interpretations? And she was like, well, you could go with the traditional one. She sent me a couple that I, I could use. And then she was like, but, you know, you can just do what you want, <laughs> which is like extreme reconstruction as rabbi behavior. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and so I think in a couple of places I preserved Adonai, but I don't I don't translate it into the English. And I think that that's part of. Um, that's partly me, like being, you know, a, a Mordechai Kaplan a devotee, I think, um, and and wanting to make space for different ways that people in, interpret these words, and and also recognize um, that we can have a sense of awe that doesn't require a belief in the supernatural, and that in some sense that is is what we do is we are relating to awe and to the awesome um and if you don't understand it as supernatural then it's the awesome in us it's the awesome in photosynthesis um it, it is the awesome in the fabric that we we make together i do think there's a tension there that i i take um i am I take relationship to ancestors very, very seriously. Not necessarily because I think they're like hovering over me and watching my every move. Um, but I think that this is part of like my my black tradition um, to have an altar to the ancestors and to be in conversation with the ancestors. And I certainly saw the writing of the book at each stage of me trying to be in conversation with the ancestors. And I think that um, including those prayers was one way of doing that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I, um, you write very beautifully about awe and in, in some ways, like none of us knows what God is, right. It's just some, it's just an idea that there is something larger than ourselves that has some kind of power and the universe certainly fits that bill. It seems yes. to me someone who doesn't I mean, know anything I, about the universe, but I don't, I don't think that we necessarily like, I'm, I don't, I don't know. I guess this is going to sound like anti-religious or whatever. I don't think you need God. It's great if you've got God and you're doing good things with that. <laughs> um, but I don't think you need it in, in order to kind of have that majestic experience. Um, I think that, that that's that's really important. And I also actually genuinely think it's important to communicate to people that it is okay to have a relationship with a religious community. I think that, you know, coming at this as a Black person, not even from the perspective of being Jewish, um, half the country still goes to church. And um, a majority of Black America goes to church or believes in God. Um, if scientists walk around suggesting that if you are a religious person that you can't engage with science that you can't be scientific it doesn't serve scientists and it's actually a way of suggesting that science is an exclusive club that specifically um people from marginalized backgrounds are less likely to be welcomed in um i will say though that um, I had a number of Jewish people come to me and say, I feel like you have given me permission to be more comfortable and open about my Jewishness mm -hmm. in, in doing this. And so I think that, you know, Jews are usually, I think, not the targets for, for this kind of thing. I think partly because there's some understanding that not all Jews, even if you, you know, go for high holy days, it doesn't necessarily mean you believe in the supernatural. You can be a Jewish and be an atheist. You can be a religious Jew and be an atheist, um, which often surprises Christians. But here, here we are, right? Um, one of the great things about Judaism. But I do think that even Jews um, experience that tension, and I don't think it actually serves science, and I don't actually think it even serves um, the public relations disaster that we're dealing with right now.
Uh, well, there's so much more we could talk about, but I, unfortunately our time has come to an end, but I very much hope that people will, um, will read your book if they haven't already. And I want to thank you so much, Shonda, for sharing your insights about the wonder of physics and the universe. And, um, you know, I think we have, we have so much to learn from your unique expertise. And though your field is, is distinct in many ways from the history that is JWA's work, I think your book really helps illuminate the ways that incorporating new questions and new perspectives changes the whole equation of what's possible. So thank you so much for um, being with us tonight and for sharing your work with us. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about Jewish women in physics, we have many of, uh, in our encyclopedia, as you've seen, uh, Betsy's been putting them into the chat. Um, so many names that I'm sure most of them you have never heard. So check them out. Um, and in general, I encourage you to check out the many, many resources that we have in our digital archive at jwa.org, uh, from online exhibits to the encyclopedia to podcast, a multi-generational blog. We have a lot of material to discover and help you gain insight about the diversity of the Jewish story. Thank I you also so much for having me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope you will all join us next week, same time, same place, for a conversation with Professor Annalise Hines on her book, Mahjong, A Chinese Game in the Making of Modern American Culture. And thank you all for joining us tonight. It was wonderful to be with you again. Until next time, be well. <laughs>